The U.S. Congress is in chaos. I don't think voting against Kevin McCarthy is chaos. I think $33 trillion in debt is chaos. It had nothing to do about spending. It all was about getting attention. The federal debt is one of those problems that's so big, so abstract, that it's hard to talk about. I'm not here to tell you to worry about the federal debt or not to worry about the federal debt. But this isn't like so many other political issues in America. You can view this purely as a math problem. The question is, how much can and should the government borrow? So I'm doing this video to walk through the numbers I look at to answer that question. That way you can look at this huge issue and decide for yourself. You can find links to all the data I mentioned below. But let's start off with the elephant in the room. An enormous amount of Americans have been worrying about our debt and deficits for years and years, and for good reason. It consistently ranks as a top issue for voters. It's not hard to see why. It doesn't feel great that the federal government spends more money than it collects and has for a long time. Since the end of World War II, Congress has balanced its budget about once every 10 years on average. And most of those times were during the 50s and 60s. The deficits have also gotten a lot bigger since the 70s. From the end of World War II to the mid 70s, federal deficits as a percentage of GDP averaged 0.6%. That average has grown sixfold to 3.6% since then. If that doesn't sound like a lot, remember that the US economy is a $25 trillion juggernaut. So a deficit of 3.6% as a percentage of GDP is a cool trillion dollars. That's a lot of money to spend that you don't have. And it adds up to a whopping federal debt of more than $30 trillion. But the US government isn't like you and me. We can't spend more than we make for long without going broke. For one thing, there's only so much we can borrow. And the little we can borrow usually comes at a ridiculously high interest rate. If you haven't looked at the rate your credit card charges, take a peek. The point is that the federal government can borrow a lot more than we can and at much lower interest rates. Uncle Sam has a lot more leverage than you and me. Individuals can't issue bonds to global investors who eagerly buy them up. As much as politicians like to compare the federal debt to a personal one, it's apples and oranges. Of course, that doesn't mean the government can borrow endlessly. Here are the five main things I look at to answer that question. The first is interest rates. The yield on 30-year treasuries is the rate at which investors are willing to lend the federal government money for 30 years. The cheaper that rate, the cheaper the government can borrow. Going back to the late 70s, that rate has been as high as 15% and as low as 1%. Obviously, when rates are low, it makes a lot more sense to borrow. Right now, that rate is 5%, which is about average. The second factor I look at is the ratio of debt to GDP. Right now, that ratio is about 1.2, which is high, but not alarming. The debt to GDP ratio was about that high during World War II and eventually fell to as low as 0.3 in the 1970s. There isn't a bright line that tells you when debt to GDP is too high, but we can take a cue from the private sector. The biggest businesses in the US routinely take on debt to invest in their future. They're basically betting that the payoff from those investments will be higher than the interest they pay on their debt. One common measure for companies, for example, is debt to equity. Equity is just a fancy word for the value of a company after you subtract its debt. The debt to equity ratio of the S&P 500 index, which tracks 500 of the biggest public companies in the US, is about the same as the US's debt to GDP ratio. In fact, the S&P 500's debt to equity ratio is routinely above one, and investors are usually not terribly concerned until that ratio inches closer to two. But it's worth noting that according to the Congressional Budget Office, if the federal government doesn't get its deficits under control, our debt to GDP ratio will be close to two by 2053. The third factor I look at is inflation. The US Federal Reserve, which is in charge of keeping inflation low and steady, has an inflation target of 2% a year. Essentially, the Fed wants prices to rise slowly and gradually to minimize disruption to the economy from fast changing prices, either up or down. One potential side effect of government spending, particularly deficit spending, is that it can stimulate the economy and therefore feed inflation. If inflation runs too high, it's probably not a good idea for the government to increase its spending. Right now, inflation is running about 3 to 4% and the Fed is trying to bring it down. So it's not a great time for Congress to crank up its deficit spending. The fourth factor is leading indicators. They're basically a basket of business and market measures that try to take the real-time temperature of the economy. One popular leading indicator is the Conference Board's Leading Economic Index. A decline in the index over the previous year means trouble for the economy. It's not perfect, 
but it has done a pretty good job of spotting previous recessions in real time or even in advance. Right now, the index is down about 8% from last year, and there has never been a decline that large without a recession going back to 1960. That doesn't mean a US recession is inevitable, but it does mean that the probability of a recession is probably higher than normal. I also keep an eye on the Atlanta Fed's GDP Now tracker, which tries to estimate the real-time growth of the economy. That tracker estimates that the economy will grow at an annual rate of about 5% after inflation this quarter, which is huge growth. So things seem to look good for now. The reason it's important to keep an eye on the economy is that individuals and businesses tend to cut back on spending during the recessions, which can make them longer and more painful. Congress can make up for that decrease in spending by increasing its own spending. That's what happened during the pandemic. The economy basically stopped and Congress ramped up government spending to resuscitate it. That's a big reason why the pandemic recession lasted just two months, one of the shortest recessions on record. But it's a balancing act because too much government spending can stoke inflation. And government spending during the pandemic likely contributed to the inflation we're experiencing now. The last factor I look at is public investment. There are some things only government can do or is best positioned to do, like infrastructure and education. Government investment as a percentage of GDP has steadily declined since the 1960s. That probably explains why our roads, bridges, and ports are crumbling and why we're falling behind other developed countries in education. Underinvestment isn't sustainable in the long run, which means the U.S. will eventually have to spend more on infrastructure and human capital. A smart way to do that is to ramp up investment during recessions when the economy needs a lift. So looking at those five factors right now, here's where I come out. Interest rates are about average, so it's not a great or terrible time for the government to borrow. Debt to GDP is on the high side, but not alarmingly so. Inflation is still running too high. The economy may be heading into recession, but appears to be doing fine for now. And we need more long-term government investment. To me, that means Congress should rein in spending now, but should also look for opportunities to invest when the economy needs help. It's not as simple as spending bad, saving good. It's a constant cost-benefit analysis that involves multiple considerations. Take a look for yourself at the numbers and let us know what you think in the comments.